Hey you guys, it's Professor Smitherman Brown um, here to chat with you a little bit about chapter three and give you um, some of my notes from the chapter, some of the big important takeaways that we need to cover for this chapter. It's a little bit of a long one. Um, and by the way, this is the last chapter in unit one. So I just wanna take a moment here at the beginning with a little housekeeping to tell you about how the textbook is structured. So the first three chapters are kind of an introduction to the topic of the humanities. And in chapter three, we deal a lot with myth because myth is kind of um, the foundation for the humanities and something that we really need to talk about because um, the way that we use the term myth in the humanities is not very much at all the way that we commonly use the term myth in everyday life. So it's important for us to, to know the difference, although the two are related. Um, the next section of the textbook, chapters four through nine, deal with some of the various disciplines of the humanities. So we'll look specifically at a chapter on literature, a chapter on visual arts, a chapter on music, a chapter on film and television, cinema, and so forth. And then the remaining chapters of the text deal with themes. So the themes could include things like love or nature or freedom. And we look at how a concept like love has been portrayed by cultures around the world at different time periods and in the different mediums of the humanities. So in literature and in art, painting, music, that kind of thing. So this is the last chapter in the introduction. And then beginning next week, we're going to pick right up with chapter four, which will cover literature. So... To begin here, um, a reminder to always take a look at the learning objectives that are posted in Canvas and are posted at the beginning of each chapter. This will always be a good guide to help prepare you for the exam. So let's start right away with talking about what is mythology. So just like in the last chapter when we were talking about critical thinking, this is a term that we very often take for granted um, this idea of a myth. And so very often when people use that term today and there's and you might hear someone say something like, you're telling me a myth, what they typically mean is you're telling me something that is false, right? So I want to go ahead and, and dispel that definition right here from the beginning. So a myth is not something that is false. Now, many of the myths that we're going to cover in the class, people no longer hang on to these and they, they no longer believe them. But what you should know about myth is that very much so there was a time and a place in which people very much believed in whatever the story is. So then what is a myth? It's really a story. We don't typically know where it begins. Um, most of the time it begins in an oral history. So before people are writing down stories, they're telling stories um, through the generations. And so we don't always know where it originates from. Sometimes it can have a historical basis. But what a myth does is a story that we tell ourselves that helps us to explain some thing that we don't otherwise know how to explain. So myths can help us to explain aspects of nature, where human beings come from, the purpose of human life, the origins of the world, or the customs and religious rites and so forth of a people. Myths exist in prehistory. So again, going back to that oral culture, even before people are writing down their stories, they're telling them for sure. Um, myth very much underlies all disciplines of the humanities. People construct stories that help them to explain the ways of the world and the purpose for their own life. Very often in myths that we're going to encounter, we see universal elements, and we'll sort of talk about that today. So one example of this is a flood story, and you might think of um, a religion or text that features a massive flood that wipes out most humans. This is actually a story that, can sit, that exists in several different cultures. So we'll look at at least two in, in the realm of this course. Um, before we get here, before we get here, I just want to emphasize one more time that a myth, not necessarily something that is false. It's something that absolutely is believed at some point by a group of people. And it's essentially the stories we tell ourselves the way that we organize our world. So I give that kind of disclaimer because one of the ways that people very often explain where they came from and what their purpose is 
um, is through a religious system. And so for thinking about this in terms of text, many religions, all of the religions really, uh, qualify as myth. Every religion has an origin story that does its best to explain where people came from. So this is why I want to again um, reiterate that it doesn't mean that those stories are false. There are and have been people who wholeheartedly believe the stories. It's just a way of making sense of the world. Okay. So all that being said, uh, this is one of the first images that we um, might encounter. And in this image, um, we have um, a wall painting. This is a cave painting. And this is one of the earliest examples of artwork that we know. So this is from a period known as the Paleolithic period. It's a prehistory period. So in prehistoric times, it's before people are writing with any kind of alphabet. Um, so it dates from about 15,000 BCE, but we do have as an artifact from this period, this uh, wall painting with a bird-headed man, a bison, which we see here, and a rhinoceros. So the one of the very earliest artifacts that we have then is trying to put into pictorial form um, an explanation of everyday life, right? And so we have this figure here that's part man, has a bird head, and he's face-to-face -face with this large animal, this bison. And there's a lot of stories about why people might have made a painting such as this. We believe for the most part that, well, there's a couple of different theories, really. This could be instructions on how to hunt bison. So this is thought to be a sphere that belongs to this man. So it has a bird uh, topper, like he has the bird head. And this seems to show a trajectory here and suggest that in order to... Um, basically uh, line up the kill shot, you would want to aim for this area along the belly. And this circle coming out from the belly of the bison are entrails, the guts of the bison. So this would be the ideal shot when you're hunting a bison. So this documents not only what kind of animals were in the region, but also lets us know that people during this period were um, hunting these animals. So what does this have to do with myth? For the most part, uh, we know a couple of things about Paleolithic people. We know, one, they don't live in caves. They're nomadic people. They follow um, the herds of animals that they're hunting. They make makeshift shelters. And instead, they often use caves for ceremonial type events. And so there's an idea that has long been circulating here that what a painting like this um, conveys is a sort of wish fulfillment. So there might be some sort of her ceremony before a hunt and where this depiction is made as a way to sort of capture the spirit, capture the agency of the animal featured here in hopes of securing it not only in pictorial form on the, li on the limestone, but also securing it the following day in the hunt. So this kind of um, ceremony is this sort of myth. It's this sort of story, right? That if we're able to capture the image of the bison on this limestone, this will help us to kind of think through and fulfill our wish to have a successful hunt the next day. Uh, that also might be what accounts for the fact that the animal is depicted here with some amount of naturalism. We've got a reference to hair. The shape is, you know, pretty natural. We have this um, this sort of uh, 3D perspective here. So there's an attempt here to make the animal look natural, and yet the human figure is very abstract. So if this was used in a ceremony where we're trying to capture the spirit, capture the agency of the animal, we don't want the same thing to happen here to the human figure. So that might also account for their abstraction. But as early as people have created any type of artifact or work of art, it's been related to the world around them and trying to explain the world around them to somebody else. And that's really what myth is. So um, just to kind of further articulate this definition, the myth is a story or a tale or a belief transmitted from generation to generation. 
and it often contains a psychological truth or fulfills some deep-rooted need. So I'm going to argue that the biggest need uh, that we see among humans is to feel as though there is order in the world. And that's very much what myths strive to do. So when someone asks a question, whether than just saying, I don't know why this is happening, I don't know why it's thundering, instead someone constructs a story to try to bring order to the world. So um, again, what is not myth, myth is not something that is fake or erroneous yet widely believed, and it's not easily dismissed as false. So we have to remember that somebody at some time fervently believed many of the stories that we're going to encounter in this chapter. All right. So um, there is this um, psychologist who, his name is Carl Jung, and he begins to read a lot of stories uh, from various cultures. And he notices in reading all of these early stories, all of these myths, that there are some commonalities among many of them. Um, and so he calls these commonalities archetypes. So he says that there's models by which people comprehend and experience and cope with the baffling task of being human. So there are going to be some standard figures and some standard parts of every myth that we, or almost every myth that we encounter. So he says these archetypes are passed down, these models are passed down um, through generation to generation, but we also see them across cultures. And he believes that these are transmitted by what he calls the collective unconscious. So unconsciously, people collect these stories and have these similar experiences. So some examples here, very famously, we see in myths um, stories about journeys into death. Uh, stages that a hero has to go to in order has to go through in order to be recognized as a hero. And again, we see like the appearance of a flood. Very often there's something to do with a garden and multiple myths that we will encounter. So he begins to notice all of these commonalities and says that they're transmitted by this collective unconscious. So um, this is what Carl Jung has to say. He says, From the unconscious emanate determining influences which, independently of tradition, guarantee in every single individual a similarity and even a sameness of experience and also of the way it is represented imaginatively. One of the main proofs of this is the almost universal parallelism between mythological motifs. So he believes all... People, regardless of the culture and the time period that they grow up in, all people are sort of born with this idea um, of having the same kind of experience. That human experience is a universal experience. So other people um, kind of account for these similarities in a couple of other ways. So some people say myths are similar in different cultures because myths are spread along trade routes. So as one culture interacts with another culture through trade, they also are sharing their stories. Um, and all, there's also this idea that human beings have similar needs, that that is true enough, that there's a universal need among humans to feel safe and feel as though their world makes sense and has a purpose. And so if human need is very similar, then shouldn't the myths that explain things to us also be similar? So those could be some other reasons. But of course, Carl Jung, psychoanalyst, he believes people are just all born with the same knowledge of the same experiences. All right, so what are some of these archetypes in mythology? Uh, we have quite a few uh, that we're going to work through. Uh, one is the hero. We see hero stories in every culture. Um, another is the power of words, the power of numbers. So these are stories in which secret words or passwords or numbers play a very important role. Uh, the circle, so the circle plays an important role in a number of myths, a journey, the garden, and gods as human beings. So all of these are common tropes that we see in multiple different types of civilizations and cultures. All right, so um, beginning with the hero. 
So the hero is a monomyth, and this term monomyth means it's a world myth. So a hero story is found in almost every single culture, um, and the hero is typically somebody who is some kind of special individual, and he's ordained by fate to be the doer of these great deeds, and he often serves as a kind of savior to a whole group of people. So hero stories um, include, of course, stories from ancient Greek and Roman mythology, but if you think about even some um, more contemporary texts, arguably... Frodo Baggins from Lord of the Rings would feature as a very stereotypical hero tale. Even Harry Potter would figure as this sort of um, figure, this hero figure. So Harry Potter, for example, one of the more recent ones, he's a special individual. Of course, he's a wizard, and he is ordained by fate. There's a prophecy in Harry Potter that he is essentially going to be the person to outdo Voldemort, and he's seen as the savior of a whole group of people, so the people within the wizarding world. So all of that fits very well here. Uh, stages of the hero. And this is a really interesting one. So typically the birth of the hero, there's some sort of supernatural um, experience that happens to uh, the hero um, on the night of their birth. So the stars act all crazy or there's a dark omen or something happens on the night of the hero's birth. So there's some sort of supernatural circumstance or a supernatural circumstance early in their life. There's usually an early recognition of the hero. So someone will tell the hero that they're going to be a hero and they're destined for great things. And typically the hero denies that. Then there's the hero's great deed, the first time that they are tested. And this takes place in young adulthood, and this begins sort of their life of great feats. And one example of this is Theseus and the Minotaur, which is talked about in the textbook. This is a really fun story to know. If you don't know it, I would encourage you to Google it, where Theseus is his young hero, and he defeats the Minotaur. So this is his first, and the Minotaur is his half man, half bull. Um, so he defeats his Minotaur as his first feat. Uh, also in hero stages, sometimes the hero undergoes a loss of power. So unlike in fairy tales where there's always a happy ending, mythic heroes very often fail. They even die, but their story that lives on is what celebrates their greatness. So for example, we have this story of Oedipus, who's a great hero, and Oedipus um, befalls a pretty tragic life later on. And um, he's met with a great demise, and yet we still talk about his heroic feats in this class. So their story lives on, and that's like the good part. So really quick here, there's a real difference between Western mythology and Eastern mythology. So in Western mythology, typically there's one singular individual. And again, it's typically an individual that has some sort of special power and they're capable of astonishing feats. Whereas in Eastern mythology, uh, in the Eastern part of the world, there's this celebration of um, universal harmony and society societal good. So there's this idea that anyone can attempt to be a hero in Eastern mythology, that you don't have to be this special person. It's accessible to anybody. So, and also there's this idea that the battle that we have is often a battle with ourselves instead of some external enemy. So we see that much more in the East. All right, um, this is just stuff from the textbook. You might want to know a little bit about the mysterious stranger and how that plays into the hero story, and then also how women figure into hero stories. All right, the second archetype that uh, Jung identifies is the power of words within these great mythical stories. So um, typically, words play a really important part of several different stories. So there can sometimes be a password that someone needs to know in order to uh, make something happen. So the male hero very often is able to use, to move heaven and earth or do whatever he wants to do if he knows special words. So in the story of Oedipus Rex, and Oedipus Rex is a really great story that we'll get to, in that story, one of the first 
uh, things that Oedipus does is he defeats the Sphinx because he can solve the riddle of the Sphinx. And I would encourage you to look that up because it's a fun story. So he solves the riddle of the Sphinx. He knows the right answer. So this is the power of words. Words are typically uh, seen as this uh, this special gift that male heroes have. And it's thought to be the kind of counterbalance to the special power that females have, which is, of course, the power of life. So women have, for a long time, been viewed as these miraculous creatures because of their ability to bring life into the world. And so words become the power that men have very often. So other examples in uh, this story from A Thousand and One Nights where Aladdin comes from, we have this special word, open sesame, that um, opens up doors. We also have this great story from Rumpelstiltskin, um, and this is a childhood fairy tale. I can remember my own mom telling me this story when I was younger, where this princess has vowed to give her for her firstborn child to this um, guy rumples still skin in exchange for him helping her spin straw into gold. And when the day comes and she's supposed to give up her baby, uh, he says that he'll uh, let her keep the baby if she knows his name. So this is this idea of naming of knowing the right word can save her life here. And she does succeed at doing that. So Words are really strong. They're really powerful. We see them a lot in um, these early, this reference to knowing right, correct words. We see them a lot in these kind of stories. So, and we often use this term break to describe not keeping um, our word. So breaking a promise, breaking your word, not keeping your word. This becomes a really part, a really important part of the human experience. Likewise, numbers plays a really big role in these early myths as well. So many myths um, are centered around a certain number of things. So for example, um, 40 days and 40 nights as being the amount of time that it rains during the great flood that's figured into um, the Old Testament. In the Christian Bible, we also have a set number of days when this flood gets mentioned in another work called the Epic of Gilgamesh, Dante famously during the medieval period, when he writes his divine comedy, he has the use of three to organize this literary work and three represents the Trinity. So there's a lots and lots of examples of numbers having a lot of power. Most people have a favorite number for really no reason whatsoever. My favorite number is three, by the way. And so we give a lot of uh, power to numbers, right? So there's a few examples of this from within the book that I think are really good as well. So take a look at that. Next, the circle. So the circle is very often a common part of um, a myth story, and that symbolizes this idea of oneness, completeness, or eternity. And so marital rings have this circle shape. Um, and that sort of symbolizes the, um, the unbreakable bond between two people. The sun as this circular disc, we see that figured in a lot of different cultures. The yin and yang making up a circle with equal parts, good and bad, this balance. And then this enso circle, this comes from Zen Buddhism. And this idea is that um, an artist would make one single brush stroke trying to make a perfect complete circle. And there's parts of it that are filled in and parts of it that are a little bit more bare. And this is representative of having one go through a lifetime and having parts that are good and parts that are bad and trying to make it as perfect as possible. So other things related to the circle, seasons. Seasons work on this cyclical pattern, right? So we've got um, spring, summer, fall, winter, and it starts all over again in this never-ending cycle. Life cycles of humans and of nature also take this circular shape. So these birth and death cycles, this constant renewal. Uh, we see circles also featured in architecture. And so this is famously... Um, uh, Stonehenge in England. This is an example of a cromlech, which means circle place. And this would have, 
looked like uh, this at one point. So here we have an illustration of the entire circle and the way that it was probably um, constructed. And there's a lot of myth and story surrounding what this possibly could use for, and people are always coming up with new ideas about it. So when our book was published, I think it says that it might have been used for some sort of calendar system because uh, the, the stones here at the end line up with the summer solstice. So on the longest day of every year, as the sun rises, all of this lines up just perfectly here. Um there's been more recent research that suggests that um, there have been remains of humans found in this area and carbon dating is, is constantly testing this. And so there still exists this theory that this could have been some type of burial ground. But the circular space is an important space in many different cultures. All right. So the next... Um, the next archetype that we have here in Western mythology in particular is this concept of a journey. And in Western mythology, the journey is sort of a straight line where the hero starts at the beginning and they have a goal in mind that they have to achieve. In Eastern mythology, and this is one of the differences again between the two, there's often this series of happenings and it's much more of a cyclical, a circular motion. And sometimes things happen without a sequence or a final destination. There's much more of this idea that the journey is more important than the destination. Whereas within the Western mythology, the destination, the end result is what's most important. Okay, so here is this view of... Um, the journey of the hero. And so if you think about your favorite story that features a hero, whether it be Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, you can probably fit the action of that somewhere here along the way. So we begin here at the top where uh, we go through the first act, which is the act of separation, and that's separating the hero from the ordinary world. So he's called to adventure. Think about when Harry Potter gets his letter that he's going to go to Hogwarts. That's his sort of call to adventure. He has a moment where he doesn't believe that he's really a wizard, and then later he meets with his mentor, right? His mentor um, being Dumbledore. There's that crossing the threshold when he enters into Hogwarts. Tons of tests, tons of allies, tons of enemies. And then there's this central ordeal. So there's this major battle that happens. There's a reward that happens. And then there is this road back, right? So a road back to the ordinary world. So this is how every one of the movies or the books of Harry Potter is set up where you have this going under where there's this central enemy and everything's really bad and it looks really, really bleak. And then they come back out on top again, right? So that's kind of the setup of every one of those installments. The next archetype is the garden, and we see a garden in many different myths. Um, so certainly we think of the Garden of Eden. This figures prominently in um, Christianity and the Hebrew religion. And we also see this uh, reference to the garden and, and um, works of artists. So this, for example is by Paul Gauguin, who's a post-impressionist artist who has depicted this kind of really funky garden, this ideal oasis. So in many different cultures, there is a concept of this place where one can go to and they can really kind of get back to the roots of who they are as people without the technology, without the um, architectural advances, really just get back to nature. And even in America, we certainly have this idea that we need to get back to nature somehow. So this year, there's this huge celebration of the national parks. There's always people who are wanting to go camping on the weekends. We're, there's something that's kind of instilled in us as human beings that makes us want to return to this original garden. So here you have in this painting by Paul Gauguin, this idea explored and this idea of really getting back to one's original primitive nature. Um, we might also think of American history as being related to the garden. So when settlers discovered um, 
America, North America, there was certainly a lot of talk about it being a new Eden, this new garden where people could start over brand new. They could kind of leave behind all of the problems that were taking place in Europe at the time and go and just start all over as a group of people. So certainly that was on the minds and in the hopes of a lot of people when America was first discovered. And then finally, gods as human beings. So another trope that we see a lot in various myths are gods who are made in the image of humans. And so, um, which is a sort of a turn from what we have in the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, whereas the humans are said to be made in the image of God. So in earlier religions, especially in Greek and Roman religions, we have all of these various gods. So these are the gods from um, ancient Greek religion, a polytheistic religion. So polytheism means that there are multiple gods and so some of the main ones that you may have heard of before Zeus who is sort of the chief god god of the sky his wife Hera um, we have Poseidon who is his brother and god of the sea we also have um, figures like Athena the goddess of wisdom and war Ares the god of war Hermes the messenger god and so forth so lot and here's our friend Dionysus um, and Apollo. So here's both of them featured. They come from this era. So Dionysus holding his wine goblet. He's the god of wine and feeling and emotion. And Apollo, who's the god of music and rationality. So uh, very often why people would make their system of gods in the image of humans was to make them seem more understandable. So, and the system of gods are very much related to natural events that happen. So, for example, if there's a huge storm, if there's a huge flood, and people in ancient Greece can't quite explain why that is, they might say, oh, the god Poseidon is upset. So, they give these gods human traits like being angry, being spiteful, being vengeful, falling in love, and that helps to make them more understandable. Alrighty, so then moving right along, why do we have myths? So we've just talked about some of the common myths that we see and some of the common types that we see within myths. Um, and now we need to really kind of get down to why do we have them in the first place? So as I mentioned before, uh, people desperately need to feel as though everything has an order and has a reason. So we have that saying, you've probably heard it before, everything happens for a reason. We want desperately to believe that we exist in some sort of orderly plan, that everything is not just chaos, but truly things are happening for a reason. So myth helps us to explain creation. Uh, where do we come from? Where do people come from? What's our purpose? Where did the world come from? Myth also helps us to understand the natural world around us. So science takes the place of these stories um, in large part today. So now we can use science and really understand why there are things like hurricanes. So we no longer are sitting around and saying, well, we've got this tropical storm coming because the god Poseidon is upset with us, right? So we know a little more scientifically today, but certainly back in ancient Greece when science is limited, that would help people to understand why the world worked. So think about things, especially that you may have been told as a child, um, not because somebody didn't know the answer, but very often uh, children are told myths because Things are like atmospheric pressure in El Nino are too complicated to explain to a five-year-old. So when a five-year-old asks their parents, what's that sound when they hear thunder in the sky? Um, a lot of children get told various myths about God bowling or angels bowling or some sort of story that explains what that sound is in a way that gets the parent off the hook so they don't have to explain all about what's happening in the atmosphere. So myth also helps us to understand human suffering. So people want to know fundamentally, how did we get here? How did the world get here? And why is it that bad things happen to people, right? So myths help us to understand why, or at least attempt to give us an explanation for why bad things happen. 
And finally, myth helps us to understand things like fate and curses. So this idea um, that bad things happen all the time or really good things happen um, all the time. And so we construct myths to assume that uh, there are reasons why that, that we're sort of like destined for a kind of fate. All right, so in the text, and then also in the, if you go back to the original slides on Canvas, you can click these links, and you'll see some examples of creation myths. So there's not only um, some that you might be more familiar with, like the creation story from Genesis that's used in the Jewish faith and used in um, Islam and in Christianity, but you also can have some um, examples of Greek creation, Chinese creation, lots of really interesting things here that you should know about. In the natural world, again, early myths seek to explain nature, and early rituals are efforts to control it. So this is um, this is like this uh, little um, imprint, if you will, a little relief sculpture. Um, it was actually used to make a design on wet clay. But in any case, this comes from the region of Mesopotamia. And here we have um, all of these gods who are associated with different things related to the natural world. So this god, for example, is the god of rivers. And so flowing out of his shoulders are rivers filled with fish who are jumping upstream. We have a god of the mountain. And this god is also associated with the sun. So he's using his knife here to hack his way out of the mountain and the sun rises above him. We have a god of the hunt and so very much we have myths and we have systems of religion that help us to understand the natural world. Um, this is a really great story. This is a story from a Greek mythology about uh, Hades and Persephone um, and this one is a um, this one is the story goes here that uh, Persephone, she's the daughter of Diameter, who is um, she is the goddess of the crops and springtime and flowers. She's very much associated with. And so she is um, out walking through this meadow one day and the god of the underworld, Hades, sees her and he takes her, he kidnaps her. Well, her mother is so upset that she weeps, she falls into great despair and everything stops growing because she's not there to tend to the gardens. And so everything kind Kind of dies. Well, the other gods intercede and tell Hades that he has to give her back. Hades first makes her eat a pomegranate, six seeds from a pomegranate, and that pomegranate keeps her in the underworld, makes her come back to the underworld six months out of the year, and six months out of the year she can spend time in the above world with her mother. So this is a story that also helps us to understand uh, things like the season. So one of the reasons why there are seasons, why it grows and everything blooms in the springtime and then everything dies in the wintertime, one might have said during the Greek period that it's because that's the time when Persephone has to go back to live with Hades in the underworld. And her mother is so sad that she stops tending to everything and it dies. And then in the spring, when she's given back to her mother, she's happy and everything starts growing again. So this is a really fantastic story. This is a Baroque sculpture of this story where Hades is carrying off uh, Persephone here. And this is by the artist Bernini. All right, um, so why is there human suffering in the world? Um, there's lots of stories of curiosity and obedience. There's these stories of the Garden of Eden. So um, the Garden of Eden used in Abrahamic religions would say that there is human suffering because of original sin. And the original sin was when Adam and Eve disobeyed the order of God in the Garden of Eden. And because of that, human beings... Well, you might remember some of the punishments that were levied then. So the serpent gets punished because now human beings are going to be um, scared of the serpent forever and want to kill it whenever they come across one. Women are punished by pains of childbirth and men are punished by having to work hard all the days of their life. So this original sin um, accounts for some of... 
uh, the human suffering. There are similar stories, again, in multiple uh, myths and multiple cultures. So there's Orpheus, um, this story, there's Kentu and Nambi, Lot and his wife. So lots and lots of stories there. There's also this concept of karma that we see in Hindu and Buddhist traditions, and this is from an Eastern tradition. So karma is this idea that what people put out, the type of energy, the type of behavior and action that people put out into the world is the same type of behavior that they're going to get back. So it's sort of a play on the old golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you remember it from the Christian context with karma, you have this idea that what you put out in the world is going to be done back to you. Um, and that includes not only our behaviors and our actions, but even our thoughts. So a lot of times people make the mistake of laughing at somebody else's bad karma and that in itself might invite uh, bad karma your way. So be careful of that. All right. Uh, so, and here's an example of that. So on the internet, if you're ever on Pinterest, like I am, you might see things like this, keep calm and let karma finish it. This is the wrong kind of karma, right? Hoping that someone's karma is going to catch up with them. You're putting bad energy, bad thoughts out into the world. This is the right kind of karma. It's all about yourself. And so this idea is that if you individually do good things, good things will come your way. Likewise, if you do bad things like wish bad karma on other people, then bad things are going to be invited to come your way. So this is the idea behind karma. Alrighty. So do humans have free will? Uh, this is a really interesting part of myth that, and it debates this question. So um, are people cursed by fate um, or do they have free will? So this is really a question of um, is our life and the decisions that we're going to make, have those things already been planned out or do we have the ability to kind of alter our path and make a different way, right? So there's this great story of Oedipus in this chapter, and I really, really want you to know about it. I'll ask you about it on the exam, the first exam for sure, so make sure that you know about this one. Um, and Oedipus is a person who has a, a prophecy about what's going to happen to him in his life, and he tries to change that prophecy only to have it come true after all. So it really sort of suggests that he can't outrun fate. But I'd like for you to think about that and sort of form an opinion on that. Um, do you believe that our lives are kind of ordained by some sort of master plan, this idea that everything happens for a reason? Or are people free to make their own choices and choose a different path? Can they alter their fate in some way? All right, and just to wrap up the chapter, we have um, just a couple more things to go over. One, myths of our childhood. You might think, again, of myths that you heard. Um, these, again, are stories, and they're stories that are used to give us our morals and our values. So, for example, the three little pigs, you have this story of three pigs. Um, each one builds a house, and the wolf comes along and blows two of them down, and the third one doesn't get blown down because it's made out of sturdy, durable materials, and that pig took the longest amount of time and did it right. So the moral of the story is, is that if you do something right, the first time, it'll be long-lasting. So the pig who got done really quick and made his house out of straw, um, he just relaxed by the pool afterwards, but the wolf comes along and blows his down. But the one who makes his out of bricks that took a little bit longer, his is standing still. Uh, the book also talks about the importance of being attractive and rich. So Disney very often gets a bad rap for uh, their traditional stories like Cinderella and Snow White, which would have little girls believe that their only goal in life should be to be pretty and to be rich and to find their prince charming. And so Disney has started to kind of change that tune a little bit. And you have some different princesses like Mulan and the Frog Princess who are independent women who kind of make their own path. But in the traditional uh, Disney sense, there is a lot of criticism for them instilling that, that value in young girls. 
Again, the importance of name. So this is where that Rumpelstiltskin comes into play. And then finally, um, childhood myths also begin to delicately introduce children to dark things that happen. So for example, I can remember watching this movie, The Land Before Time, when I was a little kid and being absolutely devastated by this movie. Um, one of the dinosaurs mother dies in it similar story with Bambi we have a similar kind of thing with Dumbo and it was like the first time as a child that I had ever watched anything where this type of thing happens and so these stories are ways that we can begin to teach children about the darker realities of life good people and bad people there's often villains and stories that teach them about that um, and the reality of death as well so think about perhaps some childhood myths that you recall. Um, those are always fun to sort of look into. All right, um, some popular mythology here. So this is all, these are all common sayings that people have, such as what goes around comes around, um, mother nature. So even that term mother nature, you're basically stating that uh, nature is somehow female. So this is something that we associate with nature. Um, all you need is love. It must be fate, us versus them. All of these are detailed in the textbook, and it's really good to kind of read through each one of these to see what about it is um, related to myth. So that's a pretty complicated thing to understand. But for example, isn't that just like a man? So a man does something and we would say, isn't that just like a man? And make this kind of generalization about their gender roles, that all men would behave in this way. Gender roles become a sort of mythology, right? A story that we tell ourselves about men. So one of the popular uh, mythologies that we have in our culture is that men are uber masculine. They like to play sports. They don't cry. They're not emotional. And so not only um, these aren't necessarily false, sometimes these are these things are true, but they, we also use those same stories to then justify to ourselves when we encounter a person like that to just chalk it up to them being a man. All right. So that's it for chapter three in terms of my notes. Make sure that you're supplementing um, this with the actual textbook that you're reading up on this, filling in the gaps. I'll just use this time to kind of uh, give you the highlights for each of the areas. So as always, if any of this is unclear, you can feel free to reach out to me by email. Let me know what questions you have. And until next week when we pick up with chapter four, that's it for now.